So just remember a couple of weeks ago I preached a lesson on what the rest was for uh, the people of Israel and that uh, we needed to understand that this was a very special rest for them. And of course there are other rests in the scriptures and the one that we look forward to is to be with uh, God in heaven and we're thankful for being able to have that opportunity. I would recommend to you that uh, your preparation for the class, I'll, I'll give you a reading assignment. Uh, this next chapters four and five will be for next week. Write down some notes uh, as you read through it and you'll be pretty prepared, I think, to uh, join in the learning, uh, whether that may be in being able to help us out with comments, if that's what you want to do, or just to be able to be a little bit more in tune with what's going on. Most of us know what it's like to, to come unprepared and uh, trying to keep up with what's going on. And you can tell that the teacher is generally prepared. And uh, so here we are trying to keep up with him and we're thinking, well, I'm, I'm really happy he's at least studied more than I have. Um, of course, that's what makes you the teacher. So you get that opportunity to, to lead in that way. Joshua is really the story of the life of Joshua. It begins with the death of Moses. And then, of course, Joshua, as we've talked about, Joshua is the one who had taken over for him. He was now going to be the leader. And um, goes up to the end of his life. And so, really, what we have is not his whole life, but we have that section where he finishes off taking them into the land of promise, and then uh, at the end of that time, he dies. So um, it's, it's about probably the most important impact that he has on the Old Testament, and that is to lead the people of Israel to continue what Moses finished, or finished as much as he was allowed to. And then that's no more significance. Uh, people don't talk a lot about uh, Joshua in other Bible books, I mean, occasionally you'll pick up on him in a genealogy or something like that, but there's not a lot of interesting things as far as how other people pick them up, even though I believe that there are some interesting things. So we're going to look at uh, chapter 1 uh, through 3, and um, I think one of the great things about this is we get right from the start, you know, what God expects out of Joshua. And I think it's pretty much the same thing you expect that out of Moses. Um, he's going to have more military issues than Moses had, uh, but he's going to have to have the same spiritual backbone, backbone. So read with me now over in Joshua chapter 1, where God is encouraging him. And he says, No one will be able to oppose you all the days of your life, just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not desert you nor abandon you. So how is he going to be able to hold up as well as, I guess, is necessary? God will be with him, right? God's going to be with him, just like he was with Moses. And I suspect that uh, that was pretty encouraging to Joshua because he had seen the interaction between God and Moses, and uh, I think he was going to have that same sort of connection with God, it was going to work out well. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers and to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. And this gets mentioned a couple of times. Why do you think that would be necessary uh, to, to mention that to uh, Joshua? Yeah, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to happen to him that are going to create stress, uh, these people can be very difficult. I mean, just the fact that they're the numbers that they are is going to be certain things that are going to happen. But he, he just, he's just going to need to be strong, dealing with the people and then ultimately with the battles that will ensue when they get into uh, Joshua. Or, excuse me, when they get into the Promised Land. Um, one of the things about Joshua, and this causes some scholarly types to get bothered with it is there, there's a lot of violence in it and um, in fact there's kind of an unusual situation here not 
particularly violent, but the fact that God uses a, you know, a harlot, and uh, so obviously she's a, a more of a Gentile, if you will, not that that terminology was being used in those days, but she wasn't of the people of Israel. And some people look at that and go, well, that just doesn't sound right. I mean, here's this harlot, and, and she's being used by God. And I can understand how that works. Um, this is not an unusual thing in Scripture, really, when you look at the Old Testament, because God used, well, I think if you remember over from the book of Haggai, when, when the people were all worried about what was going on and, and what did the prophet tell the people or what did God tell the prophet? God is working. God is working with these people even though that doesn't always seem right, um, that he would take some, someone worldly. This is a more of a personal thing, so maybe that's why it's a little bit more bothersome. But you know, God would use these wicked nations to do his will. So from that point of view, it's not really inconsistent with, with who God is and, and how he works. Um, important, if you go on down, <clears throat> be strong and very courageous. Uh, verse 7, and skip on down to verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will achieve success. Now, with all the things that are going to be going on, this is one of the things that uh, strikes me here, just from a practical standpoint. Uh, what does he want him to do? Don't get away from the law. He says, meditate it on it day and night. In other words, really put some thought to what you're, what you're reading or what you happen to be studying, how accessible he had you know, in terms of copies of, of the law. But that just seems like a lot of, a lot of work to do. You know, here you are, the boss, so to speak, and then got to make sure you keep up on your study. And um, how he found talent, time for that, you know, I'm, I'm just not totally sure. Maybe I try to be a little bit too practical about stuff like this and trying to understand the nuts and bolts of it. But nevertheless, what was going to be a core to who he was and to how he was to stay in a right relationship with God? Yeah, go ahead. Got to prepare the team, and then you've got to be maintaining what your system is and that sort of thing. So I think, yeah, I think that's good, uh, Micah, that, that he, he just needs to always remember what is guiding us. What, what, so we must follow the game plan, so to speak, and he's going to find that in the law. Any other comment? All right, now, go on a little bit more uh, in chapter 1, and um, he gets the people together. And I want you to try to put yourself in their, their place. They've been out wandering around in the wilderness, as we put it. And they almost got in, but they didn't get in the first time around. Why? Because they were afraid to go in, and they didn't trust God. And so then they ended up having to wander around some more time, enough to get through a generation who was not going to be allowed to go. And so now, here they are, Joshua is now the new leader, and read with me verse 10 uh, and 11. Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourself, for within three days you are going to cross this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess it. Now, just try to put yourself there, in, in their place. Um, I don't know to what extent they, they were going to be surprised by this. I, I suspect that there was a sense that something was going to happen. They were certainly placed to be ready to go across. Um, but how do you think they reacted to this when, when he 
sent his guys around to say, okay, we're going. It's now time to leave. How do you think they might have reacted there? Yeah. Yeah. And we hope we hope that the generation from they will see that we were unwilling to do. Right. So that was a a known part of the story. And so now, after all these years have passed, um, we're going in. We're actually going to go. And I'm just you're kind of touched by what that must have been like. I mean, maybe maybe they've been sitting there and people have been talking about it for a month or something like that. Hey, we're going to be going in. Or maybe they just came in and said, now, nah, get ready, we're leaving. So how, how does that work for you in your life when someone comes in and says, okay, we're going to be leaving in 20 minutes. Need to be ready to go out the door. That's usually the male role. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Dana. Okay, right. Right. Sure. So it creates extra pressure. Yeah, so I, I suspect many of them were in that place, weren't they? They're, I mean, again, I, I think I get the sense that it's quite possible that the, the word had been going around that we're going to be going in soon. Geographically, they had to understand where they were. It must have meant something. But, but still, it, now's the time. And there's this whole you know, generation that have lived through this wandering, and now we're back to try it again. I don't know, it just seems to me that like a bunch of people would be really excited, you know, I mean, or overwhelmed, or, oh, not again. You know, I mean, you know, there are probably all kinds of different personalities that were there. But I get the sense that the whole idea was to weed out the individuals who are not that enthusiastic, and now we've got the people who are, and they want, they want to go in. So he goes on to, uh, he tells them to prepare everything, and you're going to cross the Jordan. Uh, then it goes on and gives a little bit more detail. Um, I won't go into this, but the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, remember the word, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. The Lord your God is giving you rest, and you will give, you will give, he will give you this land. And so what was going to happen was, you can go over and read about it in Numbers chapter 32, if, if you're interested in it. I, I, it's just, they were promised to get some land on the east side of Jordan. Um, supposedly had something to do with all the cattle that they had. And I'm sure there are other reasons. But nevertheless, that was promised to them. And so I think they did what's, what's natural. You know, they're sitting there, and where, well, on what land are they sitting? They're sitting on that land getting ready to cross. So what would you think about that in, in terms of, well, what this might mean to you and your families? What? Like we should stay. Yeah, let's, I mean... This is our land. We're happy here. Now you guys go fight. And um, it didn't work out that way. You know, it, it's pointed out that it's not going to be that way. Go ahead, Carol. No, that's true. Well, I, I think they had to be instructed about that. I mean, to, to, at how early they understood it, I, I'm not that sure. But I think from the beginning, they knew that that was the way it was going to be. So, but again, you know, again, I look at things practically. And I'm thinking, now, if we're here, and this is where we're going to live, well, we'll go fight a little bit or something like that, and then we'll come back. But the, there were, the, the deal was... You will do what? You'll go in and you're going to fight, and then when you get finished with whatever you're going to do in that regard, then you can come back out of there and dwell with your people. All right, so it's just an interesting thought. And as I said, go back to Numbers 32, and you can get into a little bit more of the, the reasons be, you know, behind this. So let's 
Skip on down now to verse 16 of chapter 1. And it says, Then answered Joshua, saying, All that you have commanded us we will do, and wherever you send us we will go. So this is the people answering back. Certainly it was specifically, I think, related to the other tribes. But, I mean, what's happening? He says, Will you obey Moses in all things? You know, they didn't always do such a great job of that, but I mean, that, that, was, that was what they were supposed to be doing. They were supposed to be obeying what, what Moses said. So just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. And then another one of these things that kind of gives the people who don't like violence very much is kind of this creepy, crawly kind of answer uh, that you're thinking, well, you know, everybody, everybody seems like they're going to be positive. They've got a good reason to go. Oh, I'll give you another reason. Anyone who rebels against your command and does not obey your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. <laughs> and so you know, when, you, when you think of that, you know, we're all the time trying to figure out God and you know, why does he do this and why doesn't he do it some other way. But, I mean, when you, when you think about what happened before, when they sent the spies in, the spies were afraid, they came out with their afraid. This was way back when Moses was around. And what was the punishment there? That's it, we're just going to keep wandering. That's it, you're not going in. But now, if you're going to go, you're going to be serious about going. And I think that this probably was, you know, a warning well taken by most of the people. You know, we can't, we can't whimper out here. We, we can't be afraid like the other people were, and I'm sure they were telling those stories all along. But at the, but at the same time, you're going to get punished. And, uh, yeah, go ahead, Janine. Wasn't wasn't well, of course, yeah. That, it's, it's all about war. And so, but, but it's, it's put to us that if you're not going to do it, it, you can't just walk away. So, any other thoughts on that? Okay. So, um, now we get this story of Rahab. This has always been, this is one of those favorite stories of kids' classes. You know, I think all of us who remember what we, what we learned then. It, this was one of the most fascinating stories. Um, the whole idea of this thread, red thread being hung from the window, I heard that a lot, you know, when I was growing up in sermons, you know, that, you know you've got to do all that God said, and if she decided that they weren't going to put the thread up, well then, the deal is off. And I, and I think the principle is there. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of personalities in here that, I, you know, I've always kind of found interesting. Uh, so, it got the two spies. I, I don't know why they di you know, didn't have 12 this time. You know, they, just two. Yeah, go ahead, Micah. Yeah, it's possible. I don't know. That's that's as good a reason for any of it. I mean, but I just noticed this. I, you know, at least we got two, and maybe we won't get so many opinions that are going to disrupt the whole thing again. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, it was just two, and so the two go in to uh, Shatim and say, "Go view the land, especially Jericho." So they went and entered the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and rested there. Now, how was that? Um, available to them in a, in a more easy way. You remember about where, where she lived? She lived on the wall. So I don't, I don't know if they, that was the first place they ran into or what as they got in. But nevertheless, she's right there on the wall of the city. And so they go in and uh, the spies are with her. So they went in and entered the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and rested there again. Here God uses someone who would be considered to be, and you can 
do all sorts of things in terms of going, for instance, to the New Testament and thinking about Jesus. What kind of people did Jesus hang around? Well, sinners, uh, prostitutes who happened to be you know, part of that, that group. And so someone suggested that was a way to sort of move toward you know, the ultimate, all in the world can be saved. And I think that's it's a reasonable thing. But um, yeah, yeah, that was one of the things really special about her. Yeah, that, so she, yeah. So anyway, we go on now. Now we're, we're going to kind of try to understand why does she convert, if that's how you want to look at it. It just, it seemed, I hadn't really thought of it in terms of conversion. I'm sure that must have come later, but it, it, you know, it seems, you know, she believes. She believes. And she believed just like everybody else was supposed to believe. You get the evidence of truth, and then you go with it. And that's exactly what she does. So uh, it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel, this is chapter 2, verse 2. Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the word was out that there were these, these guys, I guess, prowling around, and they're here to spy. That was, you know, the, the uh, word on the lamb. You know. So it says, The king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house. So it seems, would you draw the conclusion that it's kind of known that, I mean, that maybe she's taking them in? I mean, that's what it sort of sounds like to me. Did, did I, am I reading that wrong? Yeah. The king either knows or that Yeah, well, that's where we put this thing about location. You know, they, they came in there. Maybe that was the first place they went. But, but anyway, the king, he knows about it. And so he says, don't. The set word to Rahab saying, bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to spy out the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, yes, the men came to me. But I did not know where they were from. That wasn't true. We'll find that out later. Uh, it came about that when it was time to shut the gate at dark, that the men went out, and I do not know where the men went. In other words, about the time you know, we're shutting down, we're, we're putting up the gate of the city, you know, these guys took off and left. Was that true? No, that wasn't true. So, again, understanding how God uses certain types of people and learning to get comfortable with it. People who follow God are meant to be people who seek to have exceptional character. That's, that's, I think that's kind of the general way we look at it. You know, if you believe, you obey. It means you do the right things. You're, you're, you have good character. And so she's, she doesn't sort of present that, does she? But you see, God is using her. Now that doesn't mean that we can't get carried away with these things and say, see, you can be a, you can be a prostitute and still go to heaven. Don't, don't get carried away with it. Yeah, go ahead, Jessica. Yeah. Was it for just, it was for herself and her family, yes, yeah. but it was for a greater good. Yeah. And, and I think that's you know, one of the dilemmas that you run into, you know, uh, do you have any uh, young Jewish people up in your house, or are you keeping them, and, you know, and so the Nazis come by and, and you say, no, there's nobody here. Go ahead, Larry.
Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. There are some things more important than others, but God can law. So God can weigh those then. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, now, so it says um, the woman had taken the two men and hidden them, and she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And so it came about that when it was time to go, then they got away. So she said, Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them, and they had laid an order on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to, the, to Jordan, so to the crossing places, as soon, and as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. Okay. The people involved in this uh, were now going to be engaged in a, a deal, I guess. And what was the deal that was created between the, the spies and Rahab? Okay. Okay, Rahab wanted uh, her family stayed. And so, you know, I think it stands to reason. That's a reasonable thing. I helped you guys out, and so uh, would you protect us? And so the conditions were laid out, and, um, you know, both people had to keep their part. And so, as it turns out, they did. And so when we get down to Verse 8, it says, Now before the spies lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have despaired because of you. Now how would, I said before this was how or her faith, this was, it was built upon what? What do we, what do we usually say? We, we, we think of the book of Romans, if that's okay. The book of Romans and what? Faith, where does faith come from? Hearing the word of God. Okay. She had heard. What, what had she heard? Yeah, and they'd been, as they traveled, there had been people that had been defeated in the process. And so her conclusion is what? God must be on their side. Yeah, well, I mean, it's obvious to her that it would be better to be on their side at this point than on the people of, of our community. So it all works out, and that's exactly you know what happened. She is spared. But verse 11, when we heard these reports, our hearts melted and no courage remained in anyone any longer because of you for the Lord your God he is God in heaven above and on earth below now then please swear to me by the Lord since I have dealt kindly with you that you also will deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and save our lives from death so the men said to her our life is in is yours if you do not tell this business of ours. And it shall come about that when the Lord gives us the land that we will deal kindly uh, and faithfully with you. Then she let, let them down by a rope through the window for her house was on the city wall so that she was living on the wall and she said to them, go to the hill, hill country so that the pursuers will not encounter you and hide yourselves there for three days 
until the pursuers return. Then afterwards you may go on your way, and the men said to her, we shall be exempt from this oath to you, which you have made us swear, unless we come into the land and you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down and gather into your house your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's household. And it shall come about that anyone who goes out of the doors of your house outside will have his blood on his own head, and we will be innocent. But if anyone who is in your house, his blood will be on the head of a hand uh, uh, who's laid, who lays, excuse me, is laid on him. In other words, you're safe. You all stay in the house. And if, some, if you do come out, uh, then I'm sorry for what may happen. Now, if someone comes in to you and maybe takes lives there in your house, well, then they'll be held accountable as well. All right, so this is all a part of the deal, if you will. And as it worked out, the two men eventually returned to Joshua and the situation convinced them that God was going to give them the land. So I want you to try to draw some conclusions here. Look in uh, chapter 2 and verse 2, two excuse me, verse 24. And they said to Joshua, the Lord has indeed, after all this is discussed, the Lord has indeed handed over to us all the land furthermore, and all the inhabitants of the land have despaired because of us. So how is it they're looking at this particular incident with Rahab and, the, and how it all fell together? That this, we're sure, we're, we're sure we're going in. We're sure this is going to be successful. Yeah, go ahead, Jessica. Well, she gave a valuable thing to him. Yeah. Uh-huh. She feared a lot of stuff. Right. She, she would. She would have fear of the city. So this right. isn't just random gossip. This is someone who is right. hearing everything, probably from higher up officials down to the local officials. Right. So, so what's happening then, they're thinking, how does this all fit together? God must be at work here, I guess would be one way of looking at it. Yeah. And so... God's going to give them the land. It, it's, it's going to happen. This was the evidence. So again, the whole idea of what is the source of our faith, the source of our faith is the evidence. When we were talking about you know, how Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, we, you know, he tells them, you killed Jesus, but he also does what? He provides evidence through prophecy. Because of these prophecies, you can believe and know that it's true. They drew conclusions as a result of all this stuff happening. It must be that God is going to truly give these people the land. And I think it also gave confidence of the, of the spies. You go ahead, Dan. Right, yeah. Right. I think that's a good point. Dana makes a really good point. Yeah. She says, uh-huh. Yeah. They say, uh-huh. Yeah. So everything is making sense, I guess. You know, there shouldn't be any doubt because of the track record, like you said, about things that happened as they wandered. And there were some defeats that were there that also showed that God was with them. That would be the interpretation they would have had. And so this is, this is going to happen. And um, you would think at this point that, that at least if it can be maintained, that there's going to be a great enthusiasm. And, of course, as we know the story and as we, as we try to understand uh, what eventually is going to happen, because the first battle they have makes it appear that, okay, this is, this is it. Look, we're, we're taking the city Jericho, and, and it, it's, it's just done. It's taken care of. I wouldn't call it easy, but you could tell it was God's hand in it. There was no question about that. But then, then what happens? And this is what happens too often in life. You know, we, for instance, we know how to behave, 
And so we can do it for a while, but then somehow our character doesn't allow us to continue to be consistent in that way. Something happens to throw everything off, and so now we react in a very different way. So that's the kind of thing that would happen to them. We've won. Things are great. Um, and as long as that goes that way, then as long as there's no problems, then everything is going to be fine. And, and that's an important lesson for us all to learn. You know, that you know, we have to take responsibility for who we are and what we do. And, and trust in God. And not so much trust that everybody is going to get out of your way when you decide you don't want to maybe do the things that you should do. And so, here it is. Here's all the evidence. And if we do this, it follows through that what's going to happen? We are going to win. We are going to win because God is with us. So I'm trying to, in my own mind, think of what's, what's going on there in terms of the attitude of the people and how they're all feeling about it. And so... We go then to chapter 3, and this is where they actually cross the Jordan. Then Joshua got up early in the morning, and he and all the sons of Israel sent out from Shedem and came to the Jordan, and they spent the night there before they crossed. This is a lot of people. This is a lot of people there, as you, as you can imagine. Then at the end of the three days, the officers went through the midst of the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God with the Levites, Levitical priests carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. So, they're going to have the Ark of the Covenant, which was very significant in different battles. It was there with the people. So, so the people are able to observe that the priests have taken the Ark of the Covenant. The people aren't to go. They're to give plenty of room. It's about a half a mile. Before you go, um, you, you need to make sure there's that much distance between you and those people who are in front. And, of course, they're going according to their tribes. And uh, in verse 7... It says, Now the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel so that they will know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. So you shall command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Then Joshua said to the sons of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you will know that the living God is among you and that he will assuredly drive out from you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, and the Jebusite. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the, of the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. Now then, Take for yourselves 12 men from 12 tribes of Israel, uh, one man for each tribe, and it will come about that when the soles of the feet of the priest who carry the ark of the, covenant of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan, to, and the waters of the Jordan will be cut off, that is, the waters which are flowing down from above, and they will stand in one heap. So they're, they're just to get there and they're, they're to, to wait. And <clears throat> they're going to be waiting for a long time because they're going to be there and what, what's happening? I mean, what's going to have to happen before they move? Yeah, well, yes, but um, let's see. Go down to verse 14. So when the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan with the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and when those who were carrying the Ark came up to the Jordan and the feet of the priest carrying the Ark stepped down into the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of harvest. Then the waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap. Now they've seen this before where? 
at the Red Sea. <clears throat> All right, now, the promise was when you get down there and you're going to be crossing the river, you're going to get proof that God is behind this. This is going to be part of it. And so what's going to happen? The waters which were flowing down, from they stood up and rose in one heap. A great distance away at Adam, the city that is Zarethan, and those which were flowing down toward the sea of the Arabah, the salt sea, were completely cut off, so the people crossed opposite <clears throat> Jericho, and the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on the dry ground <coughs> while all Israel crossed on the dry ground. The water's there, they're still there. Then everybody is going to then, I mean, the way I'm reading this is that they're there with the Ark of the Covenant until all the people pass through. Does that make sense? Okay, so. Oh, the number that's been tossed around over the years is anywhere between 600,000 or 1 million and a half. And, and I don't think we know for sure. Uh, but <coughs> I've, I've never seen any, anything that says, okay, that's it. You know, yeah. Yeah. The census has been done, and it's appropriately accurate. So that, that sounds like a long time for the priest to, to be there, because when they all would get through, then what was going to happen? The water would start flowing again. So that would get people to understand this was a great thing. You know, God, God is showing us his power again. And so to motivate them to do the things that were about to happen because they're going to go to war. The book of Exodus tells us that this was the time. The time had come. The iniquity was now full. It had gotten evil enough, at least it sounds reasonable to me, for God to say, okay, now it's time to go in and to take the land, which I had promised to whom to begin with? Abraham in his person, yeah. Um, so what we've, what we've seen here now is, is the beginning. And I, I, I don't know how you could just not be excited, you know. You wouldn't, you wouldn't look at this in, a, I, I think, a... In a, in a real sort of intellectual sort of way, I don't think that's how you'd be looking at it. You'd, be, you'd just be saying, this is the power of God. So if you had any questions about it, there would not necessarily need to be any answers other than what you just deserve, observe. Yeah. Yeah, and they had doubts. Before, now they didn't send spies, you know, too deep into the land, which you know it seems like they did a little bit more in the the first trip in. But nevertheless, this was to say we can do this, and and you know the story of Rahab and the spies, and um, this whole scene here at uh, the Jordan, that was going to give the people that everyone who's walking by, what do they see? The water banked up and I don't know how at that point how you you couldn't say God is on our side but see it's not always going to be this assuring when you get into battle things start you get different kinds of challenges when life isn't going the way you think it should be going so, for next week, read chapter 4 uh, through 6. And again, just go ahead and uh, jot down notes. And uh, you'll feel very much more comfortable uh, when things are being discussed or when we're, we're reading. But um, I, th I think it, it's one of these things where I've come to the conclusion we just need to read more of the Scriptures. We need to be reading more of the scriptures and it's it's a great way to learn and it's a blessing that we most of us have the ability to do so and so we learn through reading how do you how do you stay in the law as joshua was supposed to it would have to be through 
to a great extent, his reading, which would lead him into continuing to know that God is on our side because he was going to need that kind of confidence. Okay, so let's have a word of prayer and uh, we'll be finished for the evening. Thank you, Father, for your word, which can challenge us in so many ways and help us to be humble in our learning of that word. And we pray that as we learn more of it, that it will help us to have greater faith and be led by you in more powerful ways, not just know more about it, but to practice it in the way it was intended to be practiced, uh, just like those people who trusted in the Lord when he said, it's now your land, go now and take it. Be with all those who are not feeling well and still struggling with various issues. And we, we pray that those who are away from us will, will come back safely. Help us to remember who we are, Father. We have nothing to prove to one another. We just do the best we can to serve you in the purest way that we know how. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.